you have to report all your income, no matter if you got a 1099 or not. Everyone write that down, put it in your noggin. Please don't be one of those people that it's like, oh, I didn't get a 1099, I'm not gonna count it. Oh, heck, well, the IRS wants you to put that down. Yes, that's my answer. <laughs> Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's The Business Program. I'm Courtney Shane, actor and fellow SAG, SAG After member. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Emily Churchill, Ronnie Stedman, and Ernie Charles. Hey, guys. Hey, everybody. Right. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, thank you so much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen of the audience, make sure you submit those questions. I will get started with some softball questions that I have uh, written down that are very popular that come up in my actor mastermind. And we'll get started with those and then we'll turn to the questions that get submitted. So uh, hopefully something that you have a question on audience from these questions coming up, if you think of something, throw that question in that Google form. You can find it in the chat. All right, here we go. So we're going to start with a hard one that uh -oh. uh, not a lot of actors know about or are incredibly surprised by when it happens. There's this mm -hmm. story that I end up hearing of, oh, my God, I got this letter in the mail that says I'm being fined $1,200 for not filing for the city of Los Angeles taxes or something like that and they're in shock and confused and it's really a business license with the city of los angeles that you should register for even if you don't make any money as an entertainer or as an actor or something like that can you guys clarify what it is that actors are concerned about when it comes to this los angeles city tax anybody can take it yeah. first well i i mean now same as always, boys, if you're like, that's not right, you just let me know. But I mean, so what I'll tell you is, because I get this question so much. So first things first, don't throw the letter away, y'all. Okay. We all know that. I've seen that too. They're like, oh, just throw the letter away. No, please don't. Okie dokie. Now, the city of LA, Department of Finance, they actually work with y'all. I know it's like, no, they're probably not. They will. All right, so let's just put that out there. Second off, the numbers you see on those letters are not actual numbers. Those numbers are just generated by a computer. They don't actually have, to my knowledge, they don't actually have the exact amount that you are going to be taxed on by the city of LA, okay? Um, and the reason that you're getting this letter, because this happened to me when I first moved to LA, I'm from Chicago, um, and it always comes out when they say Chicago. Um, all right, so... When you have a 1099, right, any 1099, y'all, okay, and you put it on a Schedule C, the, the return that's filed with that Schedule C and you have an LA address, Los Angeles, right, gets sent, you know, from California State to the city of LA. The city of LA is like, oh, 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 you got a business because they see a Schedule C 1099 income as a business. That's when I'll say, boys, take it from there. <laughs> uh, yeah um it's one of my least uh favorite things that happens is when people get these letters because it, it's uh yeah. it really is to in my opinion it's a bit of a a shakedown from the city of la uh but because like emily said if you you could you know you could make a thousand dollars on a one day shoot and you get you'll get one of these letters because you have to file that that schedule c in california it tells la Hey, this person filed a, a Schedule C, and so you should go. You know, so that gives LA the the reason, the impetus for doing this. Good thing to a few couple of good things to know about it because Emily got everything right, um, in my opinion. Uh, one thing to know is that if you worked less than six days for whatever it is that 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 was for the year, you, you can you are exempt from this. So you can just write them back and say this was you know if you just did a one off job or something. Um, anything other than that, if it's more than six days and you have to deal with this. So if you worked outside of the city of LA for any of those jobs in determining how much that 
you are going to be what they're going to base the tax on. You only would take 20 percent of any jobs that you did outside of L.A. Um, anything inside of L.A., you would take 100 um, percent. And another thing to note is that it's not as scary usually as what they put on there, because they like Emily said, they make up a number that they're basing it on. Um, and usually you didn't make that amount. Sometimes you might've made more, which can be a problem. Um, and, uh, but they only have access, they only have the right to access the information for your, uh, for your schedule C it has nothing to do with your W2 income. So don't accidentally, you might think, Oh, well, I got to report on my business income. As we know, everybody's running a business and your W2 income is business income, but, uh, for this purposes, it has nothing to do with that income. So don't report that because they have no idea how much you made. So you're only reporting like what happened on that schedule C. So I'm concurring with both of what they said uh, and adding to it. And first of all, we're at the point right now where we need to file the city business tax exemption for this year, 2023. And people always tell me, well, I don't know how much I'm going to make this year. Well, it's based on how much you made on last year's Schedule C. And they said, why didn't make anything? Well, then put in zero because you don't know if you're going to get a job, say a modeling job or maybe a performance job sometime in July. And all of a sudden now it's too late. So if you live in the city of L.A., it's always good to get the city business tax license thing. You can do it online. It's very simple. I'm going to use an example quick, I guess. I'll try and make it quick. It's probably, I went down there once because one of my clients got this letter saying she owed $600. And so we said, well, no, your Schedule C says you, it's on the, uh, they said that she had made $50,000. And we, Schedule C, we looked at made $6,000. And we went down there and I said, no, she only made $6,000. And they go, oh, okay. And they changed it. They said she owed like $100 or something. I said, no, no, no. I said that was made in, in Beverly Hills because that's considered, even though you're, that's like Ronnie was saying, outside the jurisdiction, everybody in L.A. County is subject to this. And then there are certain cities within L.A. that are exempt, that they have their own sort of corporation, like Beverly Hills is one, uh, Burbank is one, Santa Monica, Marina Del Rey. So hopefully that makes some sense. And uh, you can refer to other people outside the business and other tax professionals to learn what to do and so forth. I, I've heard that. It, if you earn any 1099 income, so even if you were like a paralegal or an, or an executive assistant at an office or something like that, that, that did 1099 work, well, that you I've, are still on the hook for this LA I've city tax people, if you have a LA address. Yeah, I've had people do the medical surveys things where they go in and do certain things and they get the business tax for it. What it's it, anybody who does a Schedule C and you don't know when you're going to file a Schedule C. So it's always good to have it and just claim an exemption in advance so you don't have to worry about it later. And as long as you make, when I say this exemption, you have to make less than $100,000 uh, for a small business. If it's a performing artist, it's less than $300,000 if the job is related to performing arts. Yeah, I've heard one in doubt, just register for it anyway, because it's better to just have it already registered, have your business license, even if you make zero dollars and register that zero dollars. So yeah, uh, I just want to let everybody know if I seem distracted at any moments, my four month old infant is actually hanging out right next to me. So um, baby, uh, baby old. <laughs> baby opal might make an appearance here and there but uh she's right now she's just hanging out so if i seem distracted we love babies i yeah yeah we uh, do and we I, also my, see the tax deduction too which is terrible but yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness no no well yes yes I, I appreciate the tax jokes amongst the tax yeah. peeps all right. But uh, uh, yeah, I just wanted to address that real quick. OK, so uh, tax write offs. So uh, actors ask all the time, what can I write off? What I what can't I write off for my taxes? I mean, the rules keep changing, especially, you know, the laws keep changing as far as what you get as a standard deduction. And is it worth it to write anything off as an artist if you spent less than the tax deduction or if you spent more than what the standard deduction is? You know, when is it worth it? When is it not worth it? And then what can you write off? What can't you write off? And what about like gas mileage to auditions? 
all that good stuff. Anybody who want to take it away, uh, please get started. You mean just in general, yes. like just, in, just all, job, all of, <laughs> <laughs> you're saying all just of in, this stuff. You're not, you're not, you just want to like, I'm saying tax write-offs overview. and yeah, quick overview yeah, yeah. of like what is a write-off for, for actors and what isn't a write-off for actors that sometimes actors think that they can write it off and then you go, ah, ah no, you can't, you know, and it maybe right, comes right, up right, in right. some of your meetings, right? Yeah, the, mo- the most common, so the, the general rule of thumb, I would say that the, the easiest rule of thumb is to just say, okay, if, if it is for your business, then it is going to be typically something that you can write off. I mean, in, in almost any case, um, the things that are usually uh, debate, debatable or not debatable, but that people often think that they can write off are, um, you know, like clothing. So if I bought if I bought this shirt to go to an audition, I can't write it off because I can wear this shirt at any other point. If it's general streetwear, it's not technically something. Now, if I if, if I considered it a uniform, maybe you could get away with that if you if I literally only wear it to auditions, you know, maybe it's a, now if it's a, if it's a costume or something, then that's more obvious. If you buy a clown costume or a nurse costume or whatever, um, then that's easily write off, uh, a write off. Um, and I'm trying to think of other common ones like that, but the other thing that's often confusing is the use of your, is the things that might be used for both personal and for business, like your cell phone, your internet, um, your view, your, you're viewing like your Netflix and all those, those things, cable. Um, and those you would, you typically take a percentage of those things. So, and your tax professional will help you with that. Uh, if you're using a tax professional, otherwise what you do is just take a percentage of whatever those, you know, of your cell phone usage of your, and coming up with that percentage kind of up to you. I don't, I don't think you'd ever, even in an audit, I don't think they would pull everything out and, look through your phone logs, um, but you'd want it to be a reasonable, you know, make a reasonable guess at that. And to add to that, it's considered, it has to be an ordinary and necessary expense, as the code mm-hmm. says, IRC 162. But they, IRS, if you get examined, like you were saying, they try and prove that it's a personal living expense. And that's why, it, as Ronnie said, it's great to use percentages, a percent for business and a percent for personal use. So. And I'll just add about gas, huh? Little mileage. Yeah. Um, now, this is my take, y'all. But I believe that um, the standard mileage, because the standard mileage, I think it, it was 56. I can't remember what it is this year. It's very beneficial. So for me, as an actor, I always keep just, just track of my miles. I don't worry about those gas receipts because you can literally only take gas receipts and actual expenses percentage uh not all of it but percentage or you can take mileage right your business miles against total miles and i would say mm, eight and a half out of ten times this mileage is going to be more beneficial to you than the actual expenses so if you're wondering do i keep receipts or do i keep mileage i would say always keep mileage number one and if you take actual expenses that's when you would want to keep your receipts for gas does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Opal, you are Once too cute, girl. Yeah. Sorry. And the caveat to that, I would say, is that if you lease a car, um, yes. then you then you would want to go with typically you'd want to go with actual expenses. Um, and in and either way, because a lease is caught co- at least you're actually writing you're writing off the actual lease itself. So it becomes a it, it'll it'll often be better than the mileage. Um, plus, mm-hmm. if you picked actual expenses the first year of your lease, you, you have to stick with that anyway. Uh, I was wondering too, were you, was the question relating to, um, are we allowed our expenses? Are we not on uh, federal or state mm. returns like that? Well, I have actually a follow-up question slash comment that came through okay. that you can't, you, you can't write off anything for your business because of the new law that um, like if you're earning money on a W-2, you can't write anything off. You can only write things off if you're on 1099. Yeah. Um, to add to that, you're, well, I always tell my actors, I need your expenses, period, because whatever isn't allowed on the federal return could be used on the state returns. California allows it. New York allows it. Uh, but yeah, there are, you're no longer allowed uh, unreimbursed employee expenses against uh, W-2 income. You guys want to add? Go ahead. 
Well, which is up in 2025, just FYI. True. And then you always want to give expenses anyway, because depending on, um, like Ernie said, you can get them all in California, but uh, depending on how you received your income, uh, if you have a lot of 1099, then there's, you know, that's where uh, there's some figuring that needs to be done, but um, you can take the expenses that relate to the 1099. Uh, and so you would, you would definitely want to take those expenses. Mm-hmm. But how does it work with those expenses? I mean, in, okay, fine. What the gas mileage part of it, or the, I bought a costume for all, it all- or. Yeah, any, you know, anything I, I use five percent of my cell phone, like just to kind of clarify, you know. Yeah, yeah, that would be the idea. So any any gas mileage, any I mean, any gas, not yeah, any any mileage reimbursement, mileage uh, the mileage rate, which I think is sixty two and a half cents this year. Um, it's split in two. Yeah. There's the first half and the second half. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fun. Um, so you have, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. So you have the you have the mileage you have the any of the expenses that apply to that 1099 income. Now, if it if it's kind of applies to both, then you just basically take all your expenses and take a percentage of it against the 1099 versus the the W two and the W two stuff. Like Ernie said, is only going to count on California. Um, but the uh, um, so if you're not able to really figure out like what specific was for 1099 and what was specific for W2. You just take the whole thing and, and take a percentage based on the amount of income that came in. You know, we, we used to do that with returns all the time where we would put all the expenses either on the schedule C and allocate back towards the W2 income or put them all on the 2106 as unreimbursed mm-hmm. and then allocate between the schedule C and the W2 income. So, yeah. So, yeah. The, well, the other I thing that can, wanna- Oh. oh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to piggyback because really the question comes down to, and I'm I'm talking to everybody here, wink, wink. Some people don't want to keep it receipts and I get it, right? Y'all like, this is taking too much damn time, but I'm going to be real honest with you. When you do your tax return and you have those expenses, it will be beneficial. So yes, keep the receipts, keep the expenses, keep your mileage. Yeah. <laughs> and, I've had- and, how lo- and how long do you keep them for? Uh oh. Well, I'm going to take this because I just moved y'all. And so I had to go through all my stuff and, and do a bunch. So now this is another one. If I'm wrong, let me know. But I believe so. You want to keep it three years back, right? So if um, 2021, 2022 is due April 15th, right? This coming year. So three years back from that is when at least the IRS should have sent you a letter if there is questions on your return. Now we now that is not written in stone, that is not guaranteed, but I would say you're safe, especially with three years, but up to five is prime. That's what that's what I've heard. Yeah, I'll just add to that, three years for federal and uh, four years for California. And that's from when you okay. filed your tax return. Mm-hmm. So it's no longer seven years? Well, if you have a business, they like you to keep them longer. Uh, it just depends, I mean. Uh, when I say business, like you have employees and stuff like that, then you have to keep them for a long period of time. Most CPAs say seven years. I always think five years is fine. It just depends. Okay. And then just to continue on this, as far as tax write-offs are concerned for actors, let's say you're doing self-tapes and you buy a, a background or a backdrop or something like that, and you're not going to use it for anything else. You're only using it for your auditions or for your callbacks or anything, uh, lighting, setting up lighting, things like that. Uh, are those a hundred percent tax write offable or do you have to book a 1099 gig in order to write off those equipment purchases? Well, you, you still, you, you can write them off, but they still are going to apply to whatever, whatever style of income you, you got. So if it's uh, you can't, in other words, if you only got W2 income, you can't then, Put the write those off on a on a Schedule C against no 1099 income at all, right? It kind of goes under job search too because you're using that to try and uh, obtain work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there a minimum amount of income that someone would need to earn on 1099 as an entertainer in order to have write offs? <laughs> hey, Opal. 
Oh. Opal has something to say. Yeah, she's like, I get it. <laughs> you 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 would likely have to earn just something. Yeah. On 1099, if 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 the only income you have is is 1099, um, or the W two income you have is from residual income, um, then you can likely write your stuff off. You know, uh, unless the you know unless you're still unless that residual income is being commissioned, you can likely write yourself your stuff off on a uh, on a Schedule C. And, and it's but back to the income. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, not my bad. Yeah, but you just need some income. You need some income. It doesn't matter how much. You just need something. Back so it could be five dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to see the copy of that check. Yeah, uh, it could be transferred. Yeah, once again, it would come back to maybe allocating between the incomes as well. Um, I had another point and I forgot mine too. Now, oh well. All this good stuff lost. I had a point too, and I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. This just got added and it's on the same topic. If you bought a car, can you write off like 65% of the car for business? If you're using the car to drive to auditions? Nope. You no. can, uh, if you buy a heavy SUV uh, and it's used a hundred over our, our truck, that's over 6,000 pounds. Then there is a, uh, what's called a bonus depreciation opportunity. It's still based on the percentage use of it for business. If you can buy, if you if you if you're driving an old twenty year old car, you're still getting mileage on that car. And then if you turn around and buy a new one this last year, you don't get anything more for buying that new car. You're still just mm -hmm. writing off mileage, mm -hmm. unless you do the bonus, unless you take the bonus depreciation scenario. But that's typically going to be in a situation where you know it's a work truck, it's something like that, it's something that you're using almost primarily for that. And a good thing to remember with all those tricky things like that, like the, like the bonus depreciation is that um, you only get the amount of the depreciation that you're going to get over the lifetime of that car. So it's even though they small. call it bonus, even though they call it bonus, it's not really bonus. It just means you're able to take it in one year. You're taking it all up front. So that means you don't have any more to take over the next five to six years or however, however long that car is being depreciated. Yeah. And gotcha. I just want to say each individual is different too. You know, everybody's tax return, each person seems to be completely different. I want to add to the car thing because Emily said it pretty well. Um, I always find that when I, I've been in, you know, I've been in exams with clients and so forth, represent them against the IRS. And I remember three of them were like, you kept odometer readings because we had them because they always check to see that you actually say you drove, you know, 10,331 miles that, that it works out to that. So they always ask for oil change receipts or something to identify. So I always find it very important to have the total miles driven and then you deed your business miles because from that you put in your total miles and then you put in your business miles. It'll figure out what percentage of your actual expenses could be used or it goes with the mileage rate. And like Emily said, almost... 80, 90% of the time, the mileage rate is higher. So, sorry to. Uh, don't be sorry. This It's very <laughs> gracious of you to share all this amazing information. Uh, <laughs> super, super awesome. Uh, speaking of information, I did pop something in the chat. I will put it in here again because I know some people are just arriving. Uh, there's an article on that whole LA city tax issue. Uh, I have put that in the chat again. So if anybody needs to refer to it, like what the heck are they talking about? There's, that's a really great article. Uh, also, if you're just arriving and you have a question, there's a Google form in the chat. The chat is turned off to the general audience. And so uh, you just have to go to that Google form and fill it out with the questions that you have are for our tax pros. All right, uh, going back to, <laughs> baby Opal's got something to say. Um, going, going back to the LA city taxes, uh, there is a question that popped in about that. Uh, when you mentioned 20% if filmed outside of LA versus hundred percent if working in LA, do you mean how much of that specific project to report on your income taxes? They, that's a clarifying question. Not, it's not income tax. So to be very, very clear, the city of LA business tax is has nothing to do 
with the income tax form that you're going to, that you're going to fill out your 1040 um, has nothing to do with that. Um, the only connection it has is that, that the schedule C that you filled out that California reports that to the city of LA so that they know that you filed, them. but if there's no, there's no interaction between that schedule C and your, and your city of LA business tax in with the city of LA, when they're trying to determine what your tax is going to be, they there's a code that you when you first sign up, there's a code. There's all there's I can't remember what the actor one is, but it's like um, L047 or something like that. And so to, so when you when you're filling that out, it'll say what is what of these of the amount that you made is subject to this to the city tax. So let's say if you made you know hundred thousand dollars and you made fifty of it outside the city of LA, well you would you would report to them in that particular box you would report fifty thousand plus twenty percent of the other fifty thousand, so that's what ten thousand. So you would only say that sixty thousand of the hundred thousand is is subject to to the under that code is subject to the tax because then they're going to ask how much you made overall in the next box, so they won't want to know how much you made, but in terms of it being subject to the tax. Anything made outside the city of LA, only 20% of what you make outside of LA is subject to the tax. And to continue on the 1099, are there many SAG after jobs that are on 1099, first of all? And second of all, what if you didn't receive your 1099? Should you go get it or how do you go get it? Um, this is surprising, y'all, but yes, there are SAG jobs and after jobs that are paid on 1099. I also was shocked, but it's true. Um, so yes. Um, and second off, you have to report all your income, no matter if you got a 1099 or not. Everyone write that down, put it in your noggin. Please don't be one of those people that it's like, oh, I didn't get a 1099, I'm not gonna count it. Oh, heck, well, the IRS wants you to put that down. Yes, that's my answer. <laughs> so entertaining. Yeah. So you just I, basically contact the company that hired you and say, hey, I didn't get my 1099. Yes. yes. But also make sure you keep the total, too. So if, if they don't give it to you, you at least have the number that you have to claim. Right. right. Yeah. You should track your income as you make it throughout the year. So you have an idea of what you have coming in. Um, I always keep an Excel spreadsheet of all the different incomes as they come in on my own ex example. Um, also, nice. something you might do, I know we as tax professionals do this, FTB, Franchise Tax Board, which is California State uh, uh, Revenue Department, they uh, have a website where you, we, I as professional, people give me authority and I will go look up, see how many W-2s you got for the year. So I can know in advance if you're missing a W-2. So that's something you might do is create what they call a My FTB account. And you can see what kind of, W-2 documents you can have. And then with the IRS, they have a wage and income transcripts, which are for the current year, they're not available until usually May or June, usually June. It, one year I got them in April, but most years they're behind. Yeah, that was a rare occasion. Awesome. Uh, okay, so going back to tax write-offs, where a lot of actors get confused is their SAG after dues and the commissions that they pay to their reps are those tax write offs? Absolutely. Um, simply put, yes, they are. <laughs> and the, the, the problem is, is that with the, you know, with the inability to write them off on the federal uh, tax return, you're not going to get anything, any benefit out of it. So that can be a problem if you um, are, you know, if you book a, a series or something and you're paying your agent. 10% and your manager 20% and you make, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, you, even though you might've paid out $50,000 in expenses, you're still going to pay taxes on a couple hundred thousand dollars. So it's not really fair, but that's just how it is right now. Yeah. Uh, what about if you earn money on an actor or entertainer job outside of either a California or B the United States? How, how does that impact your taxes? Do you have to pay taxes if you earn money working on a job in Italy or Australia or somewhere else outside the United States? Yes. Yes, all income is taxable. But... <laughs> all income is taxable, y'all. <laughs> um, and I do want to say this because I think this will help clear up the whole income. 
you do know what you will be issued when you go to set because you either file a W-2 or a W-9. A W-2 or W-4, you will get a W-2. A W-9, you will get a 1099. So please don't say, I don't know how I'm getting paid when you did fill out a W-4 or a W-9. Got it? Cool. All right. Yeah. And if, it, if it's less than $600 uh, for W-9, then they don't have to issue the form and you are still required to report that income. So good point. I mean, yeah. And then and do then any then of regarding, you... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say regarding your other question, the, the foreign income, um, you do... Oh, yeah. you. If you live in the United States, you pay you pay taxes on your worldwide income. If you live in California, you pay taxes on your worldwide income. But there is a if you um, but you do get a, a foreign tax credit for, uh, you know, for what you paid in taxes in that other country, if you paid taxes there. And if you pay taxes in another state, you'll you'll typically get a um, California, you'll get a tax an other state tax credit in California. Yep. for what you paid in that other state. So you don't typically get double taxed um, for that, but sometimes you will end up paying a higher tax because for instance, if you go to Canada, the taxes there are typically higher than the US. So the US is not gonna give you a tax credit for the amount that you paid in taxes in Canada because the US is probably not gonna tax you at as high of a rate. So it's, so, it's just something to know and then typically with other states, you, you almost get 100% credit for other states because Cal, not too many states uh, have a higher tax rate than California. So you'll probably get the full, the full uh, tax credit there, uh, here. Okay, so to wrap up the, the tax write-offs, do any of you either on your websites or have a, have a link to somewhere where there's like a worksheet of what the actor write-offs usually are, like lighting or your SAG after dues, da, 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 like a list, a check off, so that um, people can kind of know, well, what, what is on that list? What most preparers will have, each organization or whoever you go to has their own little system and everybody's different, but most of them have a thing called a tax organizer. And that's where you go to fill in your expenses and your First, you start with your personal information, then you fill in your expenses and different things like that. Um, and that'll help organize. And like, for example, I'm sure your websites, mine also has an article about what's, what's allowable and what's not. And then um, what was I going to mention? Um, yeah. So you have a tax organizer you can you refer to to come up with your expenses. And then there's articles out there. Same. same. Yeah. My, if you just go to the website and you look at it, I, mine's called a tax packet. But if you look, it's the same thing. And just um, because typically, like uh, Ernie said, if you're if you're using a tax professional, then you're going to you're you're not going to bring in a bunch of unorganized receipts and dump it on the desk and go, let's do this. Um, the, they're going to need you to organize it into into a place. So then so then by virtue of that, we all have tax packets that that probably are about as helpful as anything in terms of explaining what you can and can't write off. Uh, I, not, do that not every tax me, I do that if they pay me thirty thousand dollars, you know, or something. And and I need uh, I need a retainer of thirty thousand up front. There are, yeah. <laughs> but not ta every tax pro is equal because some yeah. tax professionals don't do actor taxes. You know, they don't. Not a, everybody knows. So I know she agrees with me. Um, so yeah, that's true. But if you, like. Uh, yeah, I was going to Go jump on that because, yeah, because like our tax packets uh, uh, would have like specific to actors like mine has little suggestions of like, this is what this, you know, if it says advertising, then I'll have a little explanation. This is, you know, headshots, resumes, things like that. Right, right, right. Awesome. Awesome. OK, so um, somebody's clarifying that if you only earn W-2 income, then your SAG after dues are not a write off. So do you have to have had some 1099 income in order for your SAG after dues to be a write-off? No, uh, this is this is something I feel like is going to keep coming around. So y'all, what it, what it is, you cannot take off expenses on the IRS return. This is the 2018 tax law that went into effect. It does not, it, it stops, um, expires in 2025. 
you can still take it off on the on the state side. It does suck. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie to you. Yes, it sucks. But this is the law. You can take it off on the state side. You cannot take it off on the IRS side until 2025. And that's period. But we as tax preparers do the return the exact same way. So there's nothing that's going to be different than you keeping your receipts and bringing them to us, because if they help on the state side, we're going to take them. Does that make sense? Okay. Yep. I think that, I think there was job. just confusion with the audience, so they, they they needed some clarity. So I think we got it. Yeah, that was awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to the next topic that uh, comes up a lot amongst artists, and that's S Corp LLC. When to get one? When not to have one? Is it advantageous? And you know, why would an artist consider doing that and having their checks written to their S Corp or LLC instead? So if we could just kind of go over that, and I'm sure some questions will come up uh, in the Who Google form about it? this. Yep. So uh, go for it. Nice. <laughs> I'll start and then Ronnie or Emily, you can follow. I just want to say incorporation is <laughs> a great thing because now you can deduct all your expenses, but it, it can be expensive. It can be anywhere from three to four or five thousand dollars or more, depending on on how much you you don't know what you're doing when it comes to corporations and stuff. So you guys go ahead and add to that. Um, I know Ronnie has um, specific uh, numbers, so I'm going to let Ronnie take it over. But I do want to tell you all because I've had this and it really gets my heart because as as artists, we will make a bunch of money and then sometimes we don't make any money, right? And so what I'm going to tell you is I just had um, a, a meeting with uh, an actor um, who incorporated and literally said, I feel like it, I'm losing money by having the corporation. I want you to know this because there are so many things out there that are saying to incorporate. LLC is a whole nother issue. And I don't know if you want me to get out of my soapbox about that. But um, if you can't, if you can't get those subtext, okay. Um, but uh, doing a corporation, you do owe more, you owe a lot going out. You got payroll, you got $800 at least to California. You have to, we charge to, for you have to do a corporate return and a personal return. You need to think of the things going into it before you just incorporate to take off expenses. Because if you're not making enough, you will feel like you are putting out more than you are getting advantage, right? Of tax advantage from. It's great if you if you are there at that point. And if you're not, that's okay. Okay. Ronnie, go ahead, honey. Bud. <laughs> uh yeah, I, I agree. It's um it's you, you would always want to talk to a tax professional before you incorporate because uh it, there's a lot of of misinformation. Hey, that's a a uh, very popular word these days. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there on this. And uh, so you would want to get, because it, like uh, like both Ernie and Emily said, you get you, you, there's expenses that you have to take on. So what you have to figure out with a tax professional is what's that, What where is that point where I'm saving more in taxes than I'm putting out for this corporation? And, um, and I would say, you know, everybody wants a number. So I'll, I'll give you just some, you know, somewhat guidelines of it. Uh, the easiest, the, the, the easiest way to figure it is like, what's the, um, what tax bracket are you in? Um, are you in that tax bracket for a big enough portion of time uh, to, 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 to figure out? So if, if you have, if you're in a 22% tax bracket, and let's say um, if you figure it's going to cost you a minimum of at least three grand a year for a corporation, maybe even uh, probably a little more, probably 3,000 to 3,500 if you're kind of doing everything the way I think you should do it. Um, then at 22%, that means you're going to have to have, if you're in a 22% bracket, and that means you're going to have to have about, you know what, 15,000 in deductions for, for like a break-even scenario. And that's in, because at what, 20, 22%, 15,000, that's what, $3,300, I think. So that means you're probably going to need to make at least um, seventy thousand, eighty thousand dollars with fifteen thousand in expenses. But even then, it's like you don't necessarily want to incorporate if you're right on that that razor edge because there's a it's you know it's kind of a pain. It's a whole learning curve. It's all that um, you know to 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 get into all of that. Like so, yeah, and, and you don't know what you're going to make the next year. 
necessarily. Um, so that's the, you know, that's why I would say I always talk to a, a tax professional. What I will say is that if you book a, a, a series like, and it's a full series, like you're booking a net, you know, a straight to series Netflix and it's 10 episodes and you're making $20,000 an episode, then it's almost, you know, you're going to want to incorporate, but even then don't just do it, call someone because you're going to need guidance on that because, uh, you know, you, you do have the requirement of having payroll, um, how you can't just, you can't just take money out of the corporation necessarily, uh, without planning for payroll, without planning for all those things, you're probably going to want your books done because now you have this, this thing that's not you, which I always tell my corporation clients when I'm, when I'm getting, getting them started, it's like, this thing is not you. It's not like what you're doing now, which is where, where you're just, oh, how, what did I spend on these things? And you're going through your credit cards. It's like, no, you got a whole separate set of credit cards and a whole separate bank account and everything's separate. And even though you own it, you're the owner of it and you work for it, it's not you. It's this other thing. And so your relationship to that gets a little bit complicated and you know, and all that kind of stuff. So you always want to have some guidance on that. I think another thing that people get confused on is what's the difference between an LLC and an S corp and how to know whether to go for LLC or S corp when creating that business for your entertainment career. Yeah. An LLC is in short, is not a corporation in any way, shape or form. So, but it can be an S corp. So this gets confusing. The, the term S Corp is a tax designation. So you can form an LLC or you can form a corporation and either of those can make what's called an S Corp election so that it will be taxed as an S corporation. Um, but again, you wanna to talk to someone because if you just get an LLC, that has no benefit whatsoever for you in terms of taxes, it's considered a disregarded, the IRS calls it a disregarded entity. So that's how much the IRS doesn't care what an LLC is. It's, it's just there. It's, you know, the term is limited liability company. It limits your liability. So it's, you, it's just a pass through mechanism and it does nothing for your taxes um, yeah. unless you make the S corp election. And then just having a corporation, you know, you, you're almost certainly not going to want a corporation without making the S corp election. And to add to that, that's uh, Ronnie, what you said is right on point. Um, most per, um, production companies will not will only pay to S corps or to C corps. They don't pay to LLCs. So for actors, it's not LLCs are usually used for production companies, small films or whatever. I think just remember everyone that whether you have a corporation or an LLC, you automatically owe eight hundred to California, no matter what you make mm -hmm. on all all three of them, right? So. If you form an LLC that's not a corporation and say Nickelodeon doesn't accept that LLC, they only accept an S Corp or a C Corp, you're going to be paying $800 and doing that LLC return in addition to your personal. And there's no benefit if you're not getting any income through it. Is that, is that okay? Is that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and right and, and how much, how much income people want to know, like well, how much income should you have and to constitute filing for it. I know that it was sort of like generally, oh, if you get a series regular and you're getting $20,000 an episode, but I think some people are kind of searching for a number of what's the amount of money you should be making to I would constitute say, doing it. I would say you need to consistently make at least $100,000 a year or more. Um, I'll let you guys chime in what you want to say or think. Um, well, and I think that's the key, consistent. So even though you do book that regular, that series regular, which we're all going to book, let's knock on wood for that. But if it's only a one season and the next season you don't have it, but you still have that corp. So I'm just putting that in your noggin just so you know. Um, you do, you know, you do have that. But I would say 100 to 125. Mm -hmm. Consistently. Yeah, I would say... Um... I would say ask your tax professional because it it's going to be dependent on how much you have in in deductions as well. So it, there's no it's it's always hard to just say a number. Yeah, um, not so cut and try. But yeah, I mean, because, like, you know, some actors are only making ten thousand dollars a year as an actor, and so you know that actor might be wondering, wait, should I get an escort? You know, 
It also always, factors in what happens. Like if you're if you're married, and let's say if you're married and your spouse doesn't make very much money, then a hundred thousand dollars is not is not. I I wouldn't suggest it at a hundred thousand dollars because um, you're not probably uh, depending on your expenses. So again, you got to talk to someone because you're you're probably not hitting that twenty two percent tax bracket at, at a very probably only a, a small portion of your incomes in that 22% tax bracket, which means you're going to have to have a lot more deductions to make it worth having the corporation. So that's where it gets really um, messy to try to give a, a specific, because it could be. And, and what I will say though, is again, going back to like, if you get a, if you get a bigger job, then even though, you know, that may not be there the next year, it's probably going to be worth having the corporation, even if you're stuck with it for another year, um, because you can, you can get rid of the corporation, but if you're, if you're laying off 30, 40, $50,000 in expenses, you don't want to get taxed on that 30 or 40, $50,000, because that's in, that's always in your highest tax bracket. You know, if you make, if you make a couple hundred thousand dollars, that's going to be like in a 32% bracket or at least a 24% bracket. And so even if you're stuck with a corporation for another year after that, it's worth having it in those cases because, but, but going to more towards like the bottom of like, what is, what is that? What is that threshold? Then yeah, that gets a little, that gets a little tougher to talk to someone. I want to say gotcha. uh, this is something sort of that people will always say to me, well, I should incorporate because I need to protect myself and the liability and all this. And I'm like, well, what do you own? And do you have, you know, you drive in two Ferraris, you have a couple of Picassos, you own a couple of homes or do you, no, I just have my beat up microwave and my old TV. Well, you know, what are you protecting for incorporating? So, but yeah, corporations are great to help protect you as well. Once you have that flow of income and you have those assets. So. Uh, and people are curious, how do you, like, if they do incorporate, how do you pay yourself? Do you, you know, is it the production company that, pays the LLC? Like how does that whole thing work in terms of paying yourself? Uh, um, well, yeah, that's okay. going to be a W-9. So you're going to fill out that W-9 and get, um, to because you're going to get an EIN with the corp, right? When you form a corporation, you're going to get an EIN from the IRS. That EIN is now in place of your SOCH, right? So you're going to be filling out a W-9 for your loan out. Now, here's the thing, y'all. Corporations are not required. Production is not required to give corporations a 1099. So you need to keep track of all of the corporate's income, right? But you will not be getting a W-2. You'll be getting a 1099 with no taxes withheld, and that corporation takes care of the taxes, hopefully with payroll and whatnot. Yeah, and the way that you pay, your, the way you pay yourself um, because what Emily is describing is how now that is how now you're getting paid by the by the company. So the, the the person that hires you is now not going to pay you on a W two. They're going to pay you like a W nine, like she said. But then you are required by law to do your own to do a payroll. So your corporation has to pay you payroll, and payroll doesn't mean doesn't mean I'm taking I'm going to take a couple of thousand dollars. I'm just going to transfer myself a couple thousand dollars a month or, or a week or whatever. Payroll is like, just like what you're used to right now with W2 income. It's, 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 um, you know, if you get a check that's for $10,000, you never see $10,000. You always get, there's always like, you know, eight different withholdings on there, right? They're taking out federal and state and, and SDI and social security and Medicare and all those things. That's what you have to do. Cause what it is, is that you're being, you probably heard the term loan out and that's it. You're being loaned out by your corporation to the production because the production is not allowed to pay you uh, as not an employee, unless you're being loaned out by your corporation. So by, by loaning yourself out by the corporation loaning you out, I should say that's saying I'm employed by this corporation. So that means now the corporation has to do all of that payroll and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's again, why you have to have someone, that you're talking to, don't just do all this stuff by yourself if you're going to incorporate. So then would you say if somebody's not incorporating, the best thing to do is to just do a sole proprietorship or DBA? Yeah. I mean, if you have a bit, if, if it's a, 
a 1099 style job or something like that. But you, you won't be able to be paid by a, if you go work for the Disney company, they're not going to pay your sole proprietorship. You know, they they will pay you as an employee. Um, but if you have a side job, if you're doing Uber, you know, Lyft, or if you're, if you got a side gig that you're doing, then Maybe. Yeah, you can, it doesn't matter. You can do it under your name. You can create a DBA. You can do whatever you need there. Just to throw an example, maybe they do clowning and they go around, they're a clown and they have people who hire them and they run their own little business on the side, going to parties, what have you. So they might do a BBA and form their own little sole proprietorship. But yeah. Now, what if you are a multi-hyphenate artist? You're not just an actor, right? So let's say you also are an influencer and you have brand deals and you're also a clown and you're also a dancer and you're a singer and you're a musician and you book this gig and it's all under entertainment. Well, that, that comes back to what Emily said earlier, and that is how are you getting paid? Are you filling out a W-9 and getting a 1099 NEC or a miscellaneous, or are you getting a W-2? So then your expenses apply accordingly as well. So, Well, and I'll just, I'll just say to answer that question, um, all of that that you just said, Courtney, is performing, right? I'm an influencer. I'm performing online. I'm a clown. I'm performing as a clown. I'm singing. I'm dancing. I'm doing all this stuff. So in my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if somebody came to me and was like, I want to form a corporation and I want to be able to have all these performing arts underneath it, well, that's what your corporation is. You are alone out as a performing artist, right? And you perform, you know, as a clown, as a dancer, as a singer. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, 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 ho I hope it does for everybody here. I hope as, so. As a court. As a, as a corporation, exactly, you can, and, and a corporate, if you're going to incorporate it, it doesn't mean that you can't also have another service that you provide uh, that, is, that is, so you can, you can have an entertainment component to your corporation and, you know, s some other, if you have a side business, if you're a trainer or something like that, um, that can be a, that can be a part of it. Um, that gets into more the legal aspect of things versus the tax aspect of things, but. All right. So organizing tax records. I know that we briefly talked about this before in terms of how long to keep uh, things on record. Uh, but what if somebody is behind on taxes and they haven't filed and they don't have those records, you know, how do you catch up on past taxes if you let's say you're behind by three years but you don't have any of your records how do you go about uh filing and getting caught up well there's two types of records you need uh but the first one is the most important that's your income records and if you don't have any of your income that's what i talked about earlier you can go to uh, the irs.gov and get your wage and income transcripts from them so you can find out what they are and they give you the information you need to file your returns. And then you can look at the state as well and see what W-2s you have. So that's one thing you're gonna have to get. And if you go to a tax professional, uh, they can, uh, you can pay them and they can pull them for you. Um, and the other thing is your records. Let's say you wanna have some business expenses, especially if you drove Uber or something, well, you need to go to Uber and get your, uh, your expense list thing that shows your mileage and, and things that were spent. And then if you have acting expenses and you don't have any, well, you might refer to your calendar log and maybe some of the other stuff that you have through receipts and emails and stuff like that. So you guys can add to that. I mean, I'm old school. I keep a written, <laughs> a written planner and I write down everything. So in case that does happen, hopefully you at least have some record, you know, three years back that you can look through and be like, oh, wait, I did go to that audition. Oh, there's five miles or whatnot. So, I mean, I think... You know, even if it's a Google Calendar that you have written down, you know what I mean? I think just some record that you can go back to that you can hopefully recreate the expenses that you had that year. Does that make sense? Tag and uh, uh, breakdown services, uh, Actors Access and LA oh, yeah. Casting, a lot of times have your auditions recorded in there like, oh, you got you got this audition to you go to. So anyway. That's true. Yeah, yeah I would agree. You're just doing the best you can to. To, to compile yeah. as many records as you can come up with. And you can, you, you know, you typically are going to have credit cards and bank statements and things like that, that you can 
refer back to, um, even though those are not always going to be uh, rock solid in an audit. If, if, you know, as long as you, as long as you aren't uh, cheating, uh, you could probably use those to help yourself find, find some information. Now, what about people that have minors that are uh, acting or doing entertainment mm -hmm. industry work? How do you file taxes for your under 18 year old child who is in the entertainment industry? Same way you do for an adult, really. There are a few couple of, uh, uh, it may sound odd, but if you're, you know, if your kid's five years old, they still got to pay taxes if they're making money. And so you file it the same, it's the same 1040 tax return. Uh, there's some, there's some nuances uh, because if they make, uh, um, if they have say investment income or things like that, then they, then there might be information you have to pull from the parents uh, from, from the parent's return. Uh, but in general, it's the same thing. What, one thing that you have to, to be careful about if you're doing it on your own and you're filing your kid's tax return, because I've had this happen uh, a handful of times at least, um, you want to make sure that on the kid's return, on the child return, that you mark that they're being claimed on the parent's return. Because if they're you don't... Enough. That they're dependent, yeah, that they're being claimed as dependent on the parents' returns. If you don't, then you then your taxes get screwed up whenever you file your taxes. Uh, and it can take months to sort it out. Because uh, now you're dealing with like mailing, you're dealing with like, yeah, like having to file an amended return, having to, and you no longer are able to file your return electronically. You're going to have to mail it in. And it just, it's a mess. So, just to, just to save you some trouble. And, and the best way to save that trouble too is to file yours first before you file your kids. Cause then if you, if you forget what I'm saying uh, and you still file it, it won't, theirs won't go through because it'll, it, yeah, it, cause it'll, they'll it'll show reject. that they're dependent. Yeah. I, I concur with that. You took the words right out of my mouth when you said uh, it's the same as if you were an adult. Um, one thing that I'm going to throw out real quick, I don't know if I should bring this up, but I find this with the child actors sometimes they don't make as much money because they're, you know, five years old or maybe like Courtney's got a, a little baby, you know, and they use it in a baby commercial uh, and they make like, say, five thousand dollars and they may work another job to make a thousand. So they might be a QPA where they make less than sixteen thousand and then they can adjust their income against their uh, they can use uh, they can adjust their expenses against their income. So. And one, one last thing, uh, children are not exempt. So when you file that W-4, do not put exempt on there because Sally on production said, oh, just put exempt. Then you'll have no taxes withheld and you'll have to do a return for that child and they will owe taxes, possibly, right? So, yeah. <laughs> if they make over the standard deduction would be the, yeah. yeah. And, this, and that standard deduction is 12950 this year, I think. Something like that. That was literally the next question. Perfect. Uh, oh, if you're another one just came in right now. If your child is a minor and incorporated making around 100K, do you still claim them as a dependent on the parent's return? Yes. Yes, you do. Because they're still your dependent um, unless they're paying their own way at home. Uh, but you do have to, you do, um, I'm sure whoever's asking this uh knows about the uh the coogan stuff i um, wanted to do yeah one of the tricky things with the coogan you might as well address that address the coogan account well one of the tricky things with the coogan when you have a corporation is that you have to make sure that you're reporting what went to the what went to the coogan as part of the income to the corporation um that can sometimes get lost because it's going directly to that account so if the kid make if the kid makes a hundred thousand dollars and I can't remember what the Coogan percentages are, but let's say if it's you know fifteen percent. Uh, do you do you remember? The, is that what it is? Fifteen. I'm pretty sure uh, it's fifteen percent. Yeah. So then that fifteen. I, I just went to the go. SAG after Federal Credit Union today to talk about this. It's fifteen percent. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so then that fifteen is going to go directly to their to that Coogan account. And, it, and if you're on a corporation, that means that the corporation bank account is only going to see 85. 
And so then that can be confusing. But, you know, again, if you've got a corporation, hopefully you're working with a professional on that because it's it's um, in general, there's not enough that we can probably explain uh, here uh, to help you do a corporation the cor- to handle corporations on your own. OK, so I'm, I'm looking at sort of a so there's a situation with the flood and a question about what to do about taxes with the flooding emergency. Are there new t- uh, tax due dates? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got that From information. Yeah. Most of California and federal allowed it too was um, the tax deadline. It was supposed to be April 18th, but for California got extended to May 15th due to most all counties and ca- not all, but most all counties in California are uh, emergency assistance for the floods or whatever it's called. There's a term. I don't remember. Federal. Uh, oh, Emer- yeah. Disaster yeah. area. Something like that. Emergency. Disaster yeah. Relief, disaster relief or something. Emergency. Disaster yeah. Relief. Also, I think that the, those, I have one and if some clients have got affected by it too. And there's, uh, I know the SAG foundation, I think, or the uh, actors fund has funds available for people in emergency, uh, to receive grants or different things like that too. Uh, also, just going back to the write-offs, what if you used Venmo or Zelle to pay for headshots or classes or singing lessons or anything like that? Is that considered a an okay receipt to have? Is just some screenshot of your Venmo or Zelle or something like that? Or what's considered on the up and up for that? Yeah, I'd say it, it's fine. Yeah, I I agree. Uh, I usually print them out because then you got the dates on them, and uh, you know, if you especially if it goes to your email and you print it out, it has the date on it and it has what usually you put what it's for, and so forth. So, yeah. And, and just piggybacking off of that, um, not only the expenses but the income. You have to claim the income, right? Um, And it's interesting because, and I don't know, uh, I'm sure you guys saw it too. um, The IRS now is on to (laughs) that. And like, they're like, I, you know, putting into play, you have to claim all your income. It's like, well, yeah, you've been having to claim that income (laughs) since it's been happening because it's income, right? It's coming into you. You're doing a service to get that. So that is income, no matter if it's PayPal, Venmo, Zelle, all of those um, apps. Yeah. Okay. This is something interesting that I think happens to some people where they have to take money out of their IRA uh, in light of a pandemic or just being an artist that's struggling uh, or just needing to take the money out of the IRA. How do you declare that? So that should come in a 1099-R through the financial institution that you took the money out of the retirement account. Um, that's a simple answer. <laughs> yeah, it'll it, it'll Great. you'll get a you'll get information from the from the brokerage company, and then if it, if if it were if it's as a result of some, there are some th- some uh, uh, it, what's the word Ex- exemptions. exemptions from the penalty. Yeah, yeah. From the penalty. Yeah. Uh, if it's a traditional IRA, though, you're you're going to pay taxes on that no matter what, but you may also be paying a tenant ten percent penalty. Typically you are, unless it meets the, whatever those exceptions are, then you don't have to pay the 10%. And then there's a penalty for California too. So if you have a California return. Yeah. So it's 12 and a half percent between the two. Gotcha. If it's a Roth IRA, um, then you're only, then if it's a Roth IRA that you're pulling from, then you would only pay the, the penalty and the taxes on the gains from the Roth. So you have to track how much you've put into the Roth and then whatever the gains are from the Roth. So a Roth, a Roth can be handy if you're trying to choose between the two and you don't want to deal with the, the 10% penalty and you have enough in your Roth to pull some out uh, without hitting, hitting into the, without getting into the gains area, then that's probably the better choice. And right, just so you know, people- there, is, there is income restrictions for the Roth. So it, I, I do believe it is a, a better option in that sense, but you have to make sure that on your return, your AGI, I believe it is, is not higher than the income bracket. 
there is a, um, a limit. Basically mm -hmm. pros and cons to Roth versus traditional. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the Performers Parity Act? Oh. That uh, it's something I'm going to talk to uh, Monday to the, um, I have a meeting with uh, IRS tax advocate person, but uh, the uh, Tax Parity Act is basically similar to the QPA, but they're trying to raise it to uh, actors who make less than 100000 to be able to adjust their expenses against their income. And they have been trying to get it to Congress and Senate, and it hasn't been able to get to a bill to be passed yet. Um, if it's, it was 100000 for, like I said, individual for married filing joint, it'd be 200000 or less in income, so... Uh, speaking of married filing jointly, if you are married and filing jointly, uh, do you schedule a, a Schedule C with your partner and then another Schedule C for your business? Yes, if it's mm -hmm. if, if it's two, if you have two different businesses um, and you're married, then you would have two different Schedule Cs. But if you're if you're uh, operating the same business together, then you could do it. You can have just one schedule. C. I concur. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah>, awesome. <laughs> Not uh, much else. This is, this one is, this one is specific to the East coast. This person files a schedule K generated through their LLC partnership. And they always get okay. slammed during tax season, season, usually owing thousands of dollars. And they don't really know what they're doing regarding taxes and um, could use some advice to make it easier to get through the Schedule K, I think. I'm not 100% certain on that question. Well, I'm sure it's a K-1 is what they're talking yeah. about. Yeah, uh, Schedule K-1, yeah. A K one yeah. works just like a ten, a K one from a partnership works just like a a ten a ten ninety nine. Um, so you're going to have to pay not only federal and state taxes, but you're going to have to pay the uh, Social Security and Medicare. You're going to, have to pay the self employment tax on that, which is Social Security and Medicare. Um, so that's why they're probably that's why uh, you're probably getting slammed. Is and so the only way around that is to just to pay estimated to pay your estimated taxes um, because if that's money that hasn't been taxed, it's coming from a partnership, whatever that money is coming from the partnership, you, you know, you have to pay taxes on this. There's no, there's no exception to that. That's a good, uh, let me add to that. And that is when your money comes in, whether it's 1099 NEC or like a schedule K one and you're receiving that money and taxes haven't been paid, you should do something called estimated tax payments and send off either 15, 20% of the feds and two or 3% to the state or, or maybe 10% or what you can. So you don't owe so much money at the end of the year. Well, and I think, you know, piggybacking off all that is Ernie, what you said earlier, maybe it was Ronnie, um, setting up that FTB account and the IRS account, you can just log right on in and pay those estimated payments online and you're able to see what you've paid. So at the end mm -hmm. of the year, if you're like, I don't know how many estimated payments I made or how much, you can just log in to both the IRS and the FTB and find that um, amount. Yeah, and this oh, is not, it's just an East Coast question. I mean, that's, that, that happens. I'm in New York, I would assume. A part of a Maybe. partnership, yeah. Yeah. This is interesting. What if you did some crypto trading before oh, and nice. didn't keep track of transactions? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> What? Why? <laughs> yeah. Well, it depends. Um, I'll just first say that what they now, it depends on the, on which, where they did the crypto trading, trading, because some of the organizations will issue a form saying you need to pay tax on that income, but then they have a basis for it. And some of them don't track it very well. And some of them do. Um, I've had one where I pulled their transcripts and I'm like, hey, where are all these uh, 1099 B, oh, form 1099 B, which um, is proceeds from their trading and crypto. And I'm like, you need to put this on your tax return because you're going to get a letter from the IRS in a year or two from now saying you owe money on this income. I'm like, yeah, but I lost it all. And I said, yeah, well, we need to put a basis against it so you don't owe money. 
if you don't have the information, you just got, you're going to have to do the best you can. And mm-hmm. yeah, uh, because there's, there's nothing that, you know, anyone can do for you except for you. So you're going to have to find it out and then uh, hope that the IRS doesn't come knocking um, because then it, you know, then it, it's going to be hard to, if it's, if it's that hard, I mean, there, nobody's, if you, if you can't track it, then I don't know what to tell you. You know, if you can't track it, it's hard to know what to tell you. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to double down on this question because this is this is this way I'll address uh, more than one question in, in one go. So some people are bi-coastal and they have more than one address. And then there's some people that have moved and they no longer live in uh, the state that they were previously in. So it, they'll get W-2s from both states, whether they moved or they're bi-coastal. What do you, what do, you do if you got processed for the wrong state. Do you have them reprocess your W-2 for the correct state that you were working in when you earned that income? And then how, how do you file your taxes if you are by coastal? Well, I'm going to, you guys can jump on this real quick. I just want to say, first thing you want to do is call the payroll company. I'm giving your principal place of business or wherever you're living now. You want to give them your, what's a home residence? Where is your home? And once you get that corrected, then the, hopefully they'll correct it with the state as well. And you got to make sure the payroll company knows that you're living in this state and this is where your taxes should be done. And then um, when you file your return, whatever your home state is, you, hopefully, depending on the state, you'll get credit for taxes paid to the other states. You guys can continue with that. Yeah, I was just I was actually going to say that, too. Um, if you get a W-2 and say it's from Illinois, which most actors do have W-2s with other states, right? So this is a thing that a lot of, you know, doing actors taxes, we see this a lot. But just know that if you do have, say, Illinois took out taxes, you can do an Illinois, you should do an Illinois return and then get that money back in a refund. So it's on any of these cases, you are not out the money. There is a way to get the money back, whether it's another state credit or getting a refund from that state or whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's very important to make sure you contact the payroll company so they have your new tax home, right? Your new tax address. Um, and, and if you're by coastal, you'll probably have to file a California resident, maybe a New York non-resident, right? Depending on where your tax home is, but you may have to file two or three states depending on where you do the work. Yeah. Because you're out, every state is going to get a piece if you go work in their state, and if it's and if something's if you're like, well, I never worked in that state, and I never lived in that state, then you would want to contact the payroll company. But it's usually that you worked. Usually, it's you worked there because then your residuals from that. If you go work, if you go do a commercial in New York, or if you go do a TV show in New York, um, then the residuals that come from that are are probably going to come from New York unless the payroll company will work with you and stop giving you, you know, but they, they're, they're not really, uh, they're not really obligated to do that because if, if that money was generated from that state, then that state always is going to get that, a piece of that income. And if you move, if you move, you'll, you'll, if you move within the middle, in the middle of a year, cause that was part of the question, uh, then you'll just, you'll file a, a state return you'll file a part year resident return. So you'd be part year in say California and part year in New York or Georgia yep. or wherever. I think of a example. I worked on the David Letterman show back in, I don't know, 97 or something or whatever it was. And then I moved to California. I did a comedy sketch. So I got paid for it. Nice money. And then when they were doing the final episodes of David Letterman again, they ran the episode again. And I go, oh, there it is. So I called SAG and after and told them and they said, oh yeah, okay, fill out this form. And then I got a check in the mail and and I was a California resident for like, you know, eight years now or whatever they had um, paid New York state taxes. Cause that's where I lived when I did the job. So I contacted the payroll company, had it changed. So they started withholding for California. And then I just had to file a return in New York to get, you know, some of that money back and a credit then in California. So, but yeah. And I will say this, if this comes up, y'all, if you work in Texas or Florida or another state that doesn't have taxes, mm-hmm. But you are a California resident, you will pay California resident taxes on that income. It does not mean that it is not taxed at the state level. If you're a resident of a state that taxes it, it will be taxed. Good point, Emily. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nice. Uh, okay, so uh, we just have a couple minutes left. Uh, I wanted to address uh, inheritance. 
if you inherit money, how do you claim this on your taxes? Is it is it income, and and what what do you do to for that claim? Depends. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Uh, well, let's just say this first. Most inherited is not taxable, but if it is, you should receive the tax form for it. Like if you get in a retirement fund from their person who passed away, they'll issue a form 1099R or if some other form or something. You should get a tax form for it if it's taxable. But you need to speak to the estate people or the people handling the, the payout of the money. Yeah, I can nice. say yeah, I think they're <laughs> same, same thing. And, and usually if, uh, cause this also comes up in relation to like getting, getting gifts from, you know, say like a parent or something. Um, it's usually on, if you get, if you get a, a big gift or something like that, it's not usually on you to, to it's not income to you. Um, if they give you more than the allotted amount, which I think is 16,000 now or 15,000. Yeah. Um, yeah then it's up to them to file a gift tax return. It's not on you. So you don't get taxed on it. And so an inheritance, uh, because it goes against the inher- against their, against the estate for the inheritance. Um, and so they are kind of, they are kind of connected, I guess you'd say. I do want to share a couple of resources really quick. And that is, uh Oh, baby does not like that. I want to share these things. Uh, one is abundancebound.com. The other is actorsfund.org. And oh, looks like they've been shared. Awesome. So basically, hi, honey. This is what we're going to say. Abundance Bound is an awesome organization because they teach about finances for specifically artists. And Miata, who runs the company, was at the Actors Fund for a while and was very, very helpful. See if I change my voice, it calms her down. And then the Actors Fund is an awesome nonprofit organization with lots of amazing services, including some help with your taxes. So highly recommend checking out both of those websites. Yes. Okay, you guys, this has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I would love it if you guys tax professionals would share your uh, like your Instagram handles or your websites or anything that you want to share social media wise so that people can be in touch with you. And then I am also going to share mine as well. We want to thank you so much for your incredible time and answering so many questions. And then I have my little spiel that I got to say at the end here. On behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences and process and craft with your fellow performers. And before we exit, is there any parting gifts or advice that didn't come up or anything that you want to say to the fine folks to remember to do? Uh. Uh. Don't be scared. It's going to be okay. Work with somebody that you like so that you feel good about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Part of you is you, you are a performer. So one area is educating yourself on how to handle your finances and your income and so forth. So. And it's not that scary, like she said. So enjoy it and, and have fun. I, I concur. I wish I had some, something uh, clever to say at this point, but I don't. But thanks oh, for having oh, us. Okay, we can all be on the I same. Do have Ooh, one Emily's thing. got something. I think it was Miata who said this, but you are the only person that will care as much for. No, wait. How does it? You are the only person that's going to care enough about your money, no matter who you hire. So, like your money, it, you have to care the most about it, honey buns, because you're the ones making it, right? So, make sure that you care enough about your money to keep track of all this stuff. Ooh, there it is. There and it is. hey, if. If you're making a lot of money as an artist, you're doing great. Okay. That's right. That's right. Bye, y'all. Bye. 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 Bye.